I am privileged and honored once again to bring God's word to you in the second part of a two-part series we are doing in Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10. Um, If you recall, last week we spent the morning in Romans, not just chapter 9, but we spent the morning in Romans chapter 1 through chapter 9. Through chapter 1 through 8, we set up the letter of Romans, and we set up what we read in chapter 9. We took this 10,000-foot view of Paul's uh, purpose in the letter, and really, we just we traced the gospel and all of its implications for the believer through all of chapter 1 through 8, all of the wonderful, beautiful things that we receive as Christians, like adoption and justification and eternity. And then we then concluded last week by looking at chapter 9, getting a window into the heart of Paul and his hope with a problem that he encountered, a problem all Christians encounter as we put our faith in Jesus. That's the problem of unbelief in those close to us. Last week, we saw Paul's heart of sorrow, this anguish, this visceral emotional reaction for the lost souls of his people. And then we found hope. Paul found hope in the good sovereignty of God, giving voice to something challenging for us, the doctrine of election as a comfort for the suffering of loved ones who reject Jesus. See, last week we saw Paul have hope not in the frail work and effort of a broken humanity, but in God to save. His hope was in not his ability to argue or his ability to convince or preach, but in the perfect good love of a God that would choose to redeem despite our depth of sin. And if you were with us last week, you were undoubtedly, or if you just are listening to that intro, you're undoubtedly left with questions, concerns, and even objections. As we didn't delve into really any of the questions we have about the doctrine of election and how that relates to our responsibility as human beings, rest assured that on the heels of that challenging discussion for both our hearts and our minds, this morning we're going to make an effort to follow up on that. We're going to make an effort to follow up on one of the harder questions that we have when we encounter a sovereign God who chooses. And that's what do we do? Or what should we do? With Romans 9 being true, regardless of how hard it is to wrap our minds around and conform our hearts to, if it is true, what do we do with it? Should we do anything with it other than just trust the Lord more deeply and conform in his good mor- conform to him in his good mercies? And last week, we walked away with little application by doing. Rather, the aim of our text and sermon last week was to shape our thoughts, our beliefs about God, that our hearts, our affections, and our emotions might be stirred to respond differently inward. Respond differently to the reality of lost souls in and around our lives. The application was entirely internal. But a really neat aspect of believing right things about God, of believing right things about the gospel and about ourselves, is how it shapes our doing. That there is a way to respond, and God calls us to respond. And that is exactly what Paul's going to write to us this morning. What we now do. That's the aim of our text this morning. What do we do with this doctrine and this truth? How does believing the truth of Romans 9 shape how we interact with our kids, our coworkers, our classmates? What does it mean as we go throughout our days this week? That's what we're going to see this morning in Paul's response to the same problem of unbelief that we saw last week. And this morning, we're going to kind of pull this thread through. We're going to see the Christian's responsibility as an output of faith, not an outcome of works. An output of faith, not an outcome of works. So there's a temptation for the Christian to be lazy, specifically when the doctrine of God's sovereignty and election start to take root in our lives. There's this temptation to get lazy and do nothing. It, would be, it wouldn't be unreasonable, as we have a sovereign God who chooses, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think we have little or even no role to play in what God is doing in the salvation of those around us. After all, if God's got it, why, why not just pursue a hobby we love? Why not let God handle salvation and I'll take care of my family? Let God take care of the big things and I'll take care of my future. And as we dealt with the first part in Romans 9, the sovereignty of God, Paul came to the conclusion, this conclusion of faith, trust, and comfort that God is God and we are not. 
After all the objections that he voices in Romans 9, that's the crux of his response to those objections. God is God, and we are not. That's a great and glorious thing when seen through the lens of all we have in the gospel, that the antidote to the anguished, broken heart of unbelief we have for our friends and for our family and those close to us is the beauty of the sovereign God who is merciful, that God would choose to love weak and broken and foolish things like us, like Paul. And yet the second part of that problem is the responsibility of man. We saw that at the very end of chapter 9, the responsibility of Israel. See, what follows faith is as tied to faith itself and salvation. The result of faith is not only freedom of an eternal inheritance, it's not merely obedience and holiness, which Paul spends the rest of Romans talking about starting in chapter 12, but a proper response and an inevitable response to faith is the commission of the Christian to participate in the salvation of the lost through the means that God has sovereignly ordained. In other words, the role that we as Christians play as tools in God's hands regarding the salvation of those we love. And this morning we're going to see Paul do, act, call us to act in three ways. One, faithful prayer. Two, preaching faith in Jesus, and three, sending the faithful. So we're going to see that those three acts, those three doings of how Paul responds to the lost in his life and the doctrine of God's sovereignty. And it's telling in verse 1 of chapter 10 how Paul himself responds to this idea of a sovereign God and how he knows we will respond to it with all these questions that he voices. Look at how he continues the, Roman, or the letter in the Romans in chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them as they might be saved, them as those Israelites that have rejected Jesus that he loves, cares about so deeply. Once again, at this very beginning of this text, we see Paul's heart. Look back with me at chapter 9, verse 2. Well, let's read chapter, verse 1. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness. It's Paul saying, like, for real, like 100, I'm here that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. His heart is broken at the realization and the reality that everything that he has in the gospel that he holds so dear, that those close to him, his brothers and sisters, do not have. That those that he's been closest to in his life stand apart from God's grace without hope. And we see in chapter 10, verse 1, Paul's heart once again, a longing and a desire paired with and even answered by that anguish is a hope, a desire, and a prayer. He expresses sadness and sorrow and this deep anguish in their state of lostness and yet ends with this hope in his heart that that would not always be the case. And what is different between these two verses, what exists in chapter 9? What we looked at last week, God's sovereign will and his mercy. Because Paul knows that no matter how obstinate and no matter how rebellious and resentful, no matter how deeply rooted Israel's commitment to opposing Jesus is, there's no one person outside the purview of God's will, including the very people, Israel, that rejected Jesus. For further evidence of God's mercy on the most rebellious, we need not look no further than the author himself, Paul. Look with me at Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. A zealous determination that no matter what Paul could become the best Pharisee, the most committed, and at the end of the day, no one can claim more of a right to the pleasure of God than Paul himself. Because he worked harder. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He obeyed better, said and did all of the right things. 
these words of Paul in the first part of chapter 10 and throughout Romans 9, they aren't a callous indictment of contempt toward a people of failure. They're Paul looking in a mirror and seeing himself and having sorrow that he knows the depth of the brokenness and sorrow and hopelessness that exists apart from Jesus. It is a heart of love and compassion that can feel their lostness. Because apart from God revealing himself to Paul on the road to Damascus, he'd be right there with them. Paul knows that the outcome of the state of their souls is not in his hands but he also knows that he can do something. There can be a holy and glorious output flowing from his hands and his heart, and in this case, his pen and his prayers. Let's read verses one through four. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. First output, the first act, the first doing Paul gives is what he does himself, and that's faithful prayer. We see Paul, we just looked at Philippians 3 where Paul explained how he was the most Pharisee of Pharisees and that wasn't enough to please God. It was nothing compared to the gospel. And right here he's describing that zeal, that righteousness, that earned place before God as nothing again. And so he prays, he responds in prayer. Now the question begged here in light of the text last week is why pray? Why pray? If God is sovereign, if he is in control, if he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and harden whom he will harden, why pray at all? Aside from the fact that we are commanded to pray in God's word by Jesus, by Paul, by Peter, by everyone in the New Testament. But if God is sovereign and no molecule is outside the bounds of his rule, what is there a need to make our requests known to him? Why pray at all? Well, I'll give you two reasons, both from our text in Romans. First, prayer is a part of our communication and communion with God. Prayer is a part of the Christian's relationship with Jesus. Remember back to last week in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. This beautiful aspect of what it means to be redeemed by Jesus. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. A deep, deep component of what it means to have that relationship with God where we can call him Abba, Father, is seeking him and knowing him in prayer, knowing him through his word and being known by him in prayer. For the Christian, prayer is not an eight ball, a lottery ticket, or a suggestion box. Prayer begins with an intimate, relational approach to God's holy throne. So regardless of the effect of prayer, regardless of any questions we ask regarding its efficacy, it is communion, relational communion with Abba Father, our Lord. When Jesus was in the garden preparing to endure the beatings and the suffering, execution on a block of wood, what did he do? He prayed. He prayed to his father. And that recorded prayer is a window into the relationship that all Christians now have as adopted sons and daughters. Look with me at Matthew 26, verse 36 through 39. Then Jesus went with them to a place, play, play, place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And asking and talking with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he went, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, 
Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In Jesus' most troubled and most anguished moment, Jesus approached the Father and asked for something. He asked for something. We saw in that verse, in chapter 8, that we get to call Jesus the same thing, or we get to call God the same thing Jesus does, Abba, Father. We get that prayer relationship, that approach relationship. We get that presence and communion with God the Father. We get to approach the Almighty God and our King, Jesus. See, before Jesus, before the fulfillment of the law, the people of Israel would need priests to be mediators for them. They could not be in the presence of God. The presence of God was too holy, too righteous, and too pure. And so they needed mediators before God. There was, they did not exist, this relational Abba Father prayer between Israel and God, not compared to what we have as believers. When Jesus died as the veil was torn, so was the veil between the sinner and God, allowing all who would call him Abba Father to also approach him, not only in our most troubled and most anguished moments, but every single moment of our life, we have access to the God of the universe. Prayer is relational communion with our Father. There's a closeness we get in this experience of prayer. Through supplication, the Westminster Confession says, offering our prayers up, offering our desires up to the Lord. Through confession, something we do individually, as well as this after our sermon today, we'll do it corporately. We're gonna confess our sin before God, offering acknowledgement of sin in our heart as a means to conform more, more wholly to his commands in his very presence. And there are so, there's so much depth to prayer that we're not gonna mine here, but there's so much depth and it goes far beyond asking for something for ourselves or even anyone else. It is relational communion with our Father. Second, prayer shapes our posture. See, the very act of prayer is submission to God. It is an acknowledgement that we need God or else we wouldn't be there in the moment. Even Jesus in the garden approaches his Father in a moment of need. And yet look once again at the content of that prayer. Look what he says in verse 36, 39. rather. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Even in asking God to relent his wrath from him, Jesus himself qualifies his request. Not that his request is supreme, not that his request must happen, but that thy will be done, not my own. Jesus prays for the will of his father to be fulfilled. And this is so tied to our communion and our relationship with the Lord. Look back to Psalm 37, verse 3 through 6. Verse 3 says this, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's the verse we all know. Verse 5, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noon day. The verse we all remember here is verse four, but notice what it is saying all together. Not pray and all your hopes and dreams will come true. You'll get everything you want and everything you need. What he's praying for here is nothing less than total conformity to the heart and holiness of God. If we're trusting in the Lord, doing good to his glory, faithful to obey and honor, delighting ourselves not in the things of this world, but in his joy and goodness, committed to his ways and not ours. Our heart's desire at the end of the day won't be for anything but for the will and glory of God, just like Jesus in the garden in a most anguished moment. See, prayer then serves to shape us as Christians into a posture of humility that would pray. Even in the hardest and most anxious moments, not my will be done, but thy it is not God conforming to our hearts and our desires and our needs and our hopes and our dreams. It is us conforming to the heart and will of God. Therefore, Paul prays. Paul prays for their lost souls. 
Knowing all that he does about the will of God and the sovereignty of his rule, Paul still prays. First reason we can know that the doctrine of election and God's sovereignty doesn't mean sit on your hands and do nothing is because the very first thing Paul does after Romans 9 is something. He does something. He prays. That humble relational act of prayer before God. Brothers and sisters, we are to pray without ceasing for your good, for God's glory, and most certainly for the salvation of those we care about. Pray that our hearts might be buoyed like Paul's by the emotional and psychological freedom of trusting in the Lord with what is most burdensome as the sole state of our friends and family. See, every night, my wife and I, we have two daughters, Harper, she's three, Sophia, it's like eight weeks or nine weeks or something. Every night we pray with Harper in bed, and every single night I ask God to save her soul. And my thoughts have drifted into those dark places of what-ifs and maybes, of hopes and plans and strategies, what I might someday do or someday say to persuade her to trust in no other but Jesus. But in that prayer, it is only God who can woo and work in her heart. It is only by his mercy and grace and kindness that Harper might be adopted as I have been. And with everything that God did overcome in this wretched soul, in Paul's wretched, persecuting soul, without a doubt in my mind, Jesus can overcome that in anyone's, including my daughter's. We long for their salvation. We pray without ceasing. We posture our hearts as humbly submissive to the Lord, bending our will to his, knowing that he is wiser, that he is kinder, that he is more merciful and gracious and glorious than I am. And so we pray. The second thing Paul does in our text this morning is he preaches faith in Jesus. It's the second output of Paul in our text this morning, the second thing he does in response to this hard truth and this hard reality. Read Romans 10, verse 5 through 13 with me. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul's beating the same drum he's been beating since Romans 3. The same drum of righteousness through faith and not righteousness through works of the law or through effort. Righteousness through faith in the works of Jesus and not any effort to please God and keep the law. And this tension is constant for Paul and the New Testament Christians. And he beats it by preaching to the Romans over and over and over again the supremacy of faith in the righteousness of Jesus compared to the deficiency of faith in themselves. Consistently teaching what law keeping has not and cannot do before God. And in part, we can attribute this redundancy to the culture inside the church at Rome. This church was probably made up with a mixture, it was made up of a mixture of Jews and Gentiles and uh, Jewish Christians displaced by their persecution elsewhere in the world, going to Rome, the biggest, most prosperous city, and of, of Gentiles likely converted by the faith that those Jewish Christians brought. And... Um, both in the polytheistic Roman culture that these Gentiles existed in, these Greeks and Romans existed in, and in the law-keeping atonement culture of Israel, there was this assumed effort of pleasing and appeasing. 
And for these Jews, Jesus changed everything. As he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law to earn life and justification before God, not for himself, but for his people. Now, there most certainly must have been a temptation to revert to the religious practices of the old covenants of law-keeping, as Paul speaks to this tension over and over and over again from chapter 3 all the way through to where we are right now. Paul speaks of that tension in every single one of his letters to the church, Romans more so than any other. But I want you to notice something really neat here, really, really cool here, something threaded through Romans 9, 10, and 11. If you have your Bible, just take a peek at Romans 9 with me, flip back. Look back at Romans 9. Paul, in this section, in this condensed section of 9, 10, and 11, quotes the Old Testament more than anywhere else he does in his letters. In 9, verse 7, he quotes Genesis 21. In verse 9 of chapter 9, he quotes Genesis 18. Chapter, or verse 12, he quotes Genesis 25. And in 7 through 13, he's all commenting and quoting Genesis Romans 9, verse 15, in the next paragraph, he quotes Exodus 33. In 9, verse 17, he quotes Exodus 9. 14 through 18 is, again, quoting and commenting on the book of Exodus. Throughout the rest of chapter 9, he quotes Hosea 2, Isaiah 10, Isaiah 1, and Isaiah 28. And peeking forward through chapter 10 and chapter 11, over and over and over and over again, Paul is referring to, commenting on, and using the Old Testament law to point to the gospel and point to Jesus. Over and over and over again, he's using the law to point to the weakness of the law when held up against Jesus. Using the law to show that Jesus fulfills their very hope in the law before God. And as we hit Romans 10, verse 5, he's actually quoting Moses in Leviticus 18. And Romans 10, verses 6 through 8, he's quoting Deuteronomy 30. And what are his conclusions about these two verses and all of the texts he's quoting? Look at Romans 10, verses 9 through 13. Because, on the heels of his quotations of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The law itself speaks to the veracity of faith in Jesus, not the law. The law itself speaks to the veracity of faith alone in Christ alone. To the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Greek being destroyed and null as Jesus ushers in a new covenant. Paul is preaching and persuading Jews, Israelites, those law-keeping, law-trusting that are apart from the Lord Jesus, he is preaching and persuading. Paul is making an argument based on the very text of Revelation that they, these are the lost Israelites, hold to. The very revelation they cling to as a source material for their rejection of Jesus in favor of a righteousness of their own is the very source material that reasonably, logically, and prophetically leads to Jesus himself. And Paul is preaching truth in their language. But he's also preaching truth in a context that they would hear and he listen and understand that the authority that they rely on to reject Jesus is the same authority that might ultimately undermine their rejection of Jesus and lead to a faith in his righteousness. And if we were to follow Paul like Paul follows Jesus, if we were to take anything from his response to the doctrine of election and the problem of the unsaved, then we too must preach the word of Christ and preach the word of Christ in context. For Paul, the doctrine of election led him to the conclusion that he should pray and preach, that he should do something that he should participate in the glorious work that God is doing in Rome and Galatia and Samaria and Spain, all over the globe. Paul's life at this point is given as a missionary to take the gospel wherever he goes, not sitting on his hands 
Not in a million years would the doctrine of election lead Paul to isolation or complacency. Rather, he does. He works, he responds, he prays, and he preaches. And he prays and he preaches faith. Faith in the blood and work of Jesus to save. And it is so perfectly placed here again, faith. These iconic verses that we've seen, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Because it takes faith, not just for salvation, but for life, for suffering, for pain, for all the hard things we endure and deal with. It takes faith. It takes faith in the unknowns. It takes faith in the mysteries. It takes faith in the sorrow and anguish of lost loved ones. It takes faith to reconcile a perfectly, wonderfully sovereign God with a humanity that is still responsible. I think this will be the best answer that I will ever have personally for that divine conjunction between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. I think the best answer I can ever have is I don't know. I don't know. The truth is I have no idea exactly how that paradox exists and what exists in that space where God's sovereignty exists and yet my responsibility exists. I don't know how two seemingly contradicting realities can coexist at the same time and yet both be so beautifully true in the gospel. But I also don't know how the incarnation can be a thing where a 100% God can be a 100% man at the same time. To me, that's two people, not one. I don't understand how the Trinity can be three persons in one God. To me, three persons is three, not one. There's a lot that I don't understand, comprehend, or can grasp with this tiny little pea brain of mine. And yet we have faith in what Paul calls us to here, what Jesus calls us to in the Gospels. And I can know something for certain. I can know Jesus. I can have resurrection faith. I can know that his death, his burial, and his resurrection means that I get life, justification, adoption, and inheritance, and an eternity. And as I stand on top of Logan's Pass, and I look around at the beauty and the glory and the majesty of something, I could never even, every time I go to Glacier, it's like mind-blowing how vast it is. Standing atop Logan's Pass, I could see all of this that God had made. And I could be in wonder at the complexity, the depth the power. It's a good thing that I don't understand with this tiny little pea brain of mine. Because if it did, if this little thing understood the complexities and mysteries of the universe, well, God wouldn't be perfect and infinite if this fallen finite creature could understand his ways, could comprehend the majesty and mystery of the universe. See, the greatest comfort I have regarding the doctrine of election is that I cannot explain the nuances don't have answers for all of my own questions, much less anybody else's. Because if I can have resurrection faith, faith that God would raise Jesus from death, defying all known laws of the universe post-fall, then of course I can have faith that God is more complex than I could ever explain. And like Paul, can have a faith that God is sovereign and good and merciful, and yet that humanity is responsible to either reject Jesus or receive his gospel in faith. And like Paul, I can move forward with good works in faith. Look at Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10. We're getting the greatest hits of faith and salvation verses here. Ephesians two, verses eight through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no man may boast. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, there is an output by Paul. There is something to do, something to walk in, an output of good works, not to earn righteousness and justification, but because it already exists. Paul responds by doing with faithful prayer, with faithful preaching, and in our final section this morning, by sending the faithful. Sending Christians to Rome, 
sending the church, sending Christians everywhere to bring the word of Christ. Look at Romans 10, verses 14 through 17. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But if they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There are two kind of facets to this last section, two different angles to look at it from. First, there is this descriptive facet. This is Paul just describing the means. Paul describing the means of how salvation happens from unbelief to faith. They gotta hear. Well, how do they know unless they hear about them? How do they hear about them unless someone preaches? And how did someone preach to them unless that person someone sent to preach to them? So he's describing what it means to move, what it looks like, what it practically looks like to move from faithlessness to faith. And this means that by which one might arrive at the point of confessing with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in their heart that God raised him from the dead, the means by which Paul is describing is sending, commissioning Christians to take the gospel with them to preach Christ crucified to their loved ones, to their friends, and to their family. See, God could have given us absolutely nothing to do. God could have ordained that um, the means for gospel faith would have been zapping into our brains and zapping into our hearts a trust, faith, reliance on the work of Jesus. Eureka moments. Epiphanies while reading philosophy, poetry. An epiphany while standing on top of a mountain in the wilderness with a bow or on Logan's Pass at the vastness and glory of God or something else that requires no participation by believers. But he didn't. The means by which God in his sovereignty ordained for the gospel to reach Rome was by Christians bringing it there. Christians who were persecuted. Through persecution, God brought the gospel to Rome through Christians. The means by which God has ordained for the gospel to reach the ends of the earth in every tongue and every tribe is the commissioning of Christians to carry it on their tongues wherever we go. And what a privilege. What a privilege. That God would choose what is weak and foolish in the world, not only as his people, but that God would choose what is weak and foolish in the world to shame the wisdom of philosophical genius, to shame the strength of the mightiest empires, by making salvation dependent not on intelligence or power or wealth or persuasion, but on faith. A faith carried to the ends of the earth by nobodies. Nobodies that this culture persecuted. What an honor that God would choose fools like me to stand here right now. What an honor that God would choose a fool like me to bring the gospel to the University of Montana. What an honor that God would trust Jesslyn and I with two daughters to raise them in the counsel of the Lord, in our parenting, in our marriage, and in our home, proclaiming the gospel of grace. Paul's final response to this problem, this deeply rooted problem of unbelief, is sending and commissioning all Christians to be megaphones and neon signs pointing to the grace and the mercy and the glory of Jesus. With that, we have a commission to go. A call to an output. With Romans 1 through 9 framed rightly, we should be pumped. We should be jacked. We should be inspired. We should, we should be jacked that we get to go, to the, go and tell, that we get the privilege of participating in this work of God of salvation, not on behalf of our own obedience and righteousness, but on behalf of somebody else's. It's clear in scripture that we have this responsibility for ourselves, that we're responsible for our own sin and our own obedience and our own righteousness. But by God's grace, he's given us a responsibility to help others as well, see the beauty and glory and majesty of Jesus. And by God's grace, that responsibility is not our hope. Jesus is. Once we've been saved, every Christian is given the responsibility of evangelism. Look at Romans 10, verse 17 once more. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 
Look at Jesus' words in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And Jesus came to them, or Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Faith through hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Just like Paul preached truth in context and love, quoting and quoting the Old Testament, Old Testament scriptures to them, the fulfillment of Jesus for the law, every believer and every one of us is commissioned to preach the word of Christ in our context. It is not faithful or nor helpful for that matter to disseminate truth and gospel absent relational and cultural context. And the hard reality of this is that in this room and in this city, in this state, there are hundreds, if not thousands of cultures and subcultures that we all exist in. So to say formulaically, preach Jesus specifically like this, other than holding on to the truth and glory of the gospel, to give you a formula for preaching the gospel to your friends and family is not helpful. Moreover, every person hearing those words Every one of those souls that Paul has anguish for has their own experience and stories. Which is why this call for Paul isn't just for him to preach and bring the glories of the gospel to the ends of the earth. It isn't just for pastors and missionaries, but for every Christian everywhere. No one method or diagram is sufficient to codify, codify a standard operating procedure for what it means to do evangelism. The constant is faith and gospel, but the variables are nearly infinite, which is why the call for evangelism is for all believers everywhere. No one sermon on a Sunday morning, no one John Piper book, no one song is heard and received by everyone the same. So the commission to go this morning is for Montanans and Missoulians to bring the word of Christ to Missoula and Montana wherever you are, beating the same drum of gospel, beating the same drum of the gospel that Paul does, faith in the risen Christ. To everyone. Because we don't know. We don't know how it's gonna be heard and received. The parable of the sower in Matthew 13 where Jesus talks about seeds scattered on the ground. Four different kinds of ground, a path beaten, rocky ground, a thorny ground, and a good soil. All receiving the seeds of the gospel, of the kingdom of God differently, responding differently, feeling differently. See, while man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. We don't know what kind of soil litters the hearts of unbelief of those around us. But in Jesus' parable and in Romans 10, there is no qualification for where to spread that seed. Everywhere. Because it is God who looks at the heart. Finally, a word of caution and encouragement. I want to close by going back to verse one. Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Remember, this precedes all of the doing of Paul. This precedes Paul's responsibility. It does not follow it. In other words, Paul's hope here, we see this desire and this hope We see something change from the anguish in chapter 9, verse 1, and something change in the hope and desire in chapter 1 of verse 10. So what changed? Not his output. We don't get to the output until the rest of chapter 10. We don't get the doing until the rest of chapter 10. It wasn't his effort. It wasn't his prayer. It wasn't his commissioning. It wasn't his preaching. It wasn't his ability to convince, argue, or reason with the Jews. What changed was his emphasis on the sovereign rule of God. With the way we think, the hope and comfort should come after we've done something. The hope and comfort should be done after we've exhausted all of our resources to help and do. Or we can rest in our effort. In our world, the hope would come after the beautiful feet of those who bring the good news, but hope follows truth, and our works follow both. 
If you get that mixed up, you're gonna rely on yourself when you should rely on the Lord. You're gonna think too much of your cleverness or your stupidity. You're gonna attribute saving faith to your words, not the spirit of God. And you're gonna attribute unbelief as an indictment of your own effort. Blaming yourself for someone else's lack of faith, thinking what if you had done something more or said something different. The word of caution, don't find hope in your effort, find hope in the Lord. The word of encouragement, don't find hope in your effort, find hope in the Lord. It is God who saves, who wills, who works, who has mercy. Yet how honored are we that he has willed and ordained to work through us weak and foolish creatures. We are all responsible for our output, but we will never be responsible for the outcome. Only God can be. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, let us submit to you in prayer. Let us submit to your word. Lord, with, in a culture and a society and an era where knowing and explaining and reason and enlightenment means having answers, Lord, don't let our lack of answers dictate a lack of faith, love, and trust in who you are. Lord, don't let a lack of answers mean a lack of doing, a lack of obedience, a lack of evangelism. Lord, like Paul responds to this problem, like Paul responds to the sovereignty of God, let us respond. In faith, through prayer, through preaching, through going and through sending. Paul, you, Lord, you've given us work to do. Let us do it with joy. Let us do it as an honored privilege. Let us take care with what you've given us to do. Let us be careful and not reckless. Lord, help us in our weakness. Help us in our fear. Help us in our anxiety. Help us in our, our laziness, in any temptation not to do. Help us do. Lord, we love you. We need you. In your name we pray. Amen.